thank you very much for this opportunity to speak this evening about Japan. And if I may, I'd like to dedicate uh, my uh, remarks or whatever is the right way to put it to the Japanese people who suffered such a shocking crisis and disaster in March last year and who will be living with this disaster for many years and decades to come. My overriding message tonight is that it is vital that we give deep consideration to Japan and its importance to Australia and to the broader Asian relationships at a time when a white paper is under preparation about how Australia positions itself in what many call the Asian century. Much of the public attention on Asia in recent times has had a singular focus on China. India sometimes gets into the frame and other countries important to us, such as Vietnam and Indonesia, occasionally get a mention. Myanmar even has been in the news recently. Japan rates surprisingly little, except when there is some negative news to impart. For more than 40 years, I've consistently worked professionally on China issues, often in China, fluent enough for daily professional purposes in the Chinese language, and as curious, interested, and concerned about China and its people as any Australian could be about any country. But I want to emphasize that one of the most important aspects of Asia and the potential Asian century about which we should all be deeply informed is Japan. To put it another way, the Asian century cannot and must not be just a single story about one country. It is about a wide array of different nations and cultures, all of which will be important to us and to each other in different <coughs> ways over coming decades. So this evening, let's look at what it is about Japan that merits us here in Australia to consider and understand it as best we can. Professionally, I've followed Japanese matters for years and of course been resident recently for seven years in Tokyo. Many of my comments reflect insights shared with me by Japanese colleagues and friends. But in a way, it's quite a peculiar responsibility to stand up and speak of others' realities, no matter how close our <coughs> friendships and the depth of mutual respect. I'll speak first about Japan's current domestic preoccupations, and then particularly about those aspects of Japan and its regional and international role, including its relationship with Australia, which may provide important insights into understanding Asia at this critical time. Before moving into that discussion, let's be clear about several fundamentals. First, Japan's geographical position means it is in a key strategic position in this era of dynamic change in the broader Indo-Asia-Pacific region. It's not always size that matters. Second, Japan has global importance as the third largest economy after the United States and China. Japan has an important stake and interest in global economic matters. Third, as far as Australia is concerned, Japan's key strategic position and our highly successful, mature and friendly long-term partnership means Japan will remain of great importance to Australia for the long term. Our many shared perspectives and relationships include our having a common alliance partner in the United States, and we share a trilateral strategic dialogue amongst us. But there is much outside that. During this time of regional and global flux, we have a common interest and a major stake in sustaining and growing further our already very close ties. Australians and Japanese, when they meet, even in disagreement, for example, about whaling, do feel they understand each other, or at least try to. Now, to speak about Japan's current pressing preoccupations, Japan is often underestimated and even overlooked, while we are bombarded 
with unfortunately invariably uncritical publicity about the latest political or economic fashion or flavour of the month in the Australian media. While Japan has been badly knocked about in recent years, it still has much vitality and resourcefulness as a nation that will sustain its role as one of the most important countries globally and regionally for years to come. A discussion of difficulties Japan currently faces may help explain, but not justify, the scant treatment the world media gives it. First, well before the appalling series of disasters that occurred in March last year, Japan had faced particular domestic challenges for some years. Its economy has been soft for nearly 20 years. Its political system severely hampers efficient decision making. Its population of 126 or 7 million is ageing rapidly and no longer growing. I'll give you an example of what that's all about. Two years ago I went to a special arts festival down in the Setouichi Sea, uh, which is between the mainland of the Honshu and the Shikoku Island. And there was an island that we visited where the Australian artists had their works on display. And I went to the function that evening to celebrate and to thank the local residents of this island. And it was astonishing because the first thing they did when I arrived was to present this lovely little baby and ask me to hold this baby. And you know, that baby was the first child to be born on that island in 18 years. It has, in addition, a fiscal crisis already equal to over 200% of GDP, albeit that the debt is largely domestic borrowings based on Japanese bonds. On top of all these issues, the feared, and I mean that spectre at its doorstep of China's rapid economic growth and expanding influence really exercises thinking within the country about Japan's future. But the scale of the earthquake, the devastating tsunamis, and the, casca the cascading Fukushima nuclear crisis focused concerns and multiplied the complexities of all those issues many times over. Japan confronted after March the 11th, 2011, the biggest challenge it had faced since the end of the Pacific War. There had been other disasters like the Kobe earthquake in 1995, which unsettled Japan badly at the time. But the disasters of 2011 shocked the nation very deeply. The monumentally huge task of recovery and of reconstruction in the affected areas and the added layers of complexity caused by the Fukushima nuclear disaster were challenges on a scale that no country, not even Japan, with its elaborate network of earthquake emergency procedures and reasonably tight building codes which are adhered to, could have fairly prepared, it could have fully prepared uh, any country for. Needing to confront and deal with all the consequences at the same time has been a major practical challenge with psychological and deeply emotional aspects at a national level. Making substantial progress on these fronts is a huge challenge requiring national consensus and national drive. On the positive side, the nat nationwide response in the wake of these disasters, during which the Japanese people showed extraordinary reserves of stoicism, calm resolve and patience with difficult conditions, were absolutely salutary. When one at least compares the panic and chaos that often occurs when disasters happen elsewhere. But inevitably there is, and it continues, an emotional and psychological price to be paid over time. Furthermore, putting to one side what has subsequently emerged about the inept handling of the nuclear crisis when it occurred, the remarkably efficient manner in which the government was able to restore transport and communication links, given the nature of damage done, was truly impressive. Japan's corporate sector also responded in the same way, acting quickly and flexibly to, this, to restore interrupted supply chains and manufacturing bases that had been destroyed by the tsunamis. Again, there is a price. 
the scale of these disasters requires not only a superhuman effort and the national commitment on a vast scale, but an ability to sustain this over a long-term time frame for many years to come. This would be a huge challenge for any country, and by necessity we must reserve judgment about how successful Japan ultimately will be with this endeavour. While much has been done, Japan is very much still in a stage of seeking out and adopting effective strategies and plans to address some of these longer term challenges through the coming years, particularly the nuclear and energy issues and the resettlement of displaced people whose hometowns were swept away. An additional factor is that success in this recovery effort is not just in Japan's interests alone. If Japan is able to play a confident and constructive role regionally and internationally, as well as building a stronger and healthier economy, then this will be very important also for the broader region, including Australia. So we need to play our part wherever possible to encourage and assist in this process. Unfortunately, once again, our media gives little or no weight to this point. Anyone who reflects on the impressive national commitment shown by its people in the aftermath of the disasters would be very unwise to underestimate Japan's capacity to bounce back. There are other examples worthy of note. For example, in the decades following the 1867 Meiji Restoration and in the years following the end of the Pacific War, Japan demonstrated its capacity as a nation to change dramatically and to do so successfully and quite quickly. During my recent seven years working and living in Japan, I felt strongly the mix of Japan and its people's great traditional merits alongside its profoundly modern instincts. We should look forward to seeing these qualities come to the fore in these critical years. There are aspects of Japan's political system and its siloed or atrophied decision-making processes that make major changes at a national level hard to achieve. However, well-established democratic processes have meant comparatively smooth handling of some highly contentious issues. I'll not go into great depth on this issue of politics this evening. Let's consider some of the special challenges associated with Japan's long sluggish economy, its aging population, and the consequences of the earthquake, the tsunami, and nuclear disasters. Working out how best to manage these challenges currently dominates Japanese politics. Apart from the post-earthquake tsunami recovery and reconstruction effort, Prime Minister Nordar's government is preoccupied with and being tested on several key issues. First, the government is seeking to raise Japan's consumption tax, or GST, from 5% to 10% in order to increase revenue to fund growing old age pension bills and other welfare programs and to peg back the huge fiscal def deficit. Second, government is dealing with the cleanup of radiation contaminated land, managing displaced communities and nationwide energy shortages occurring as a result of the destruction of the Fukushima nuclear reactors. A central issue critically involves keeping afloat the major corporation Tokyo Electric Power, TEPCO. In addition, all 54 nuclear power reactors throughout Japan have been routinely closed, routinely closed down for maintenance, but none restarted, although maybe in the next few weeks or months there will be some restarted. Prior to March the 11th, 2011, nuclear energy amounted to 28% of the total output of electric power in Japan. Community criticism, demonstrations in the streets, all indicate widespread negativ negativity to dependence on nuclear power. Energy rationing, especially in the summer, is also now part of daily life. These are huge issues for the government to grapple with. Thirdly, government is grappling with strategies to bring about basic reform that will open up its economy to greater competition, that reduces subsidies to bloated special interests like farmers. 90% of the farmers in Japan are like you and I who perhaps have a vegetable garden and work at it at the weekend, but they still get subsidies. And in the process, all of this leads to more efficiencies and higher productivity if we can get rid of this uh, arcane uh, support for special interest groups. Fourth, 
and related to the previous point, government is considering how to conclude comprehensive FTAs with major trading partners, including Australia, and to join the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the TPP, negotiations. Here, the conservative and largely elderly agricultural groups again have a paramount influence, holding back negotiations by their truculence. Both Prime Minister Khan's government until August 2011 and now Prime Minister Nodar's government should be applauded for their leadership in taking up these challenges. None of them is easy to overcome. Let's look at the character of how PM Nodar faces up to these challenges. First is the highly fractious and adversarial, adversarial nature of the Japanese politics in recent years. Although the Democratic Party of Japan, the DPJ, has a large lower house majority, it must negotiate its legislation through the upper house where it's in the minority. The Liberal Democratic Party, the LDP, has never really accepted that it is no longer in government after having been in office nearly 50 years at the helm prior to 2009. It has relentlessly used its control in coalition with minor parties in the upper house to obstruct legislation with a view to forcing an early election. Australia can certainly sympathise with such problems. <laughs> Further, Nodder is beset by internal DPJ opposition and leadership challenges, particularly over his plans to in increase the GST. This is led cynically by Ichiro Ozawa, a party heavyweight who is opposed to Nodder and while being highly unpopular himself, is still able to control a sizeable faction of younger politicians who are concerned about losing their seats if the GST bill is passed. Norda has to minimise the leakage of votes from his own party while negotiating with the LDP, which in theory supports an increase in the GST, in order to pass the bill and therefore avert an early election. This issue currently dominates politics in Japan, and while Noda is certainly pushing the right policy buttons, there's no certainty at all he will succeed, and the possibility of an early election is quite real. Should the LDP agree to support the GST over the Ozawa Group's opposition, a realignment of the political parties is possible. This might see the majority of the DPJ joining with the LDP, and the Ozawa Group breaking away from the DPJ and joining with a number of the minor parties and potentially a new regional-based political group led by Toro Hashimoto, the popular young governor of Osaka prefecture, which is likely to perform very well in any national election. Second, grappling with TEPCO and the energy issues arising from the disaster at Fukushima is also a huge anxiety for Noda and Japan in general. Under arrangements recently announced, the government takes a controlling interest in TEPCO for 10 years, providing massive funding to keep it afloat. The government needs TEPCO to be able to restart its, some of its nuclear plants in other prefectures if it's going to be able to trade its way out of debt. TEPCO's tri crippling debt due to compensation payouts and loss of revenue following the Fukushima disaster has been made worse due to the high cost of the alternative fuels, like imported coal and LNG, needed to make up the shortfall from nuclear plants. Australian LNG providers supplied TEPCO quickly with extra cargoes immediately following the disaster and have since signed further new longer term contracts. The remit to start or restart any of the reactors is, all, is not solely in Prime Minister Nolder's control. The relevant regional governors must also agree. The Kansai region heavily depends on nuclear power, but Osaka's Governor Hashimoto has garnered popularity by opposing the restart of local reactors. This issue will continue to polarise attitudes, particularly if there is rationing or blackouts due to high demand during the summer period. While the Japanese political situation seems bleak indeed, it is important that the GST issue in Japan has now reached the top of the agenda. This demonstrates after many years of avoidance of the issue that there is finally a realisation in Japan that its fiscal debt must be brought under control to enable the government to forward its own its social welfare programs. 
Let's look at the challenges Japan faces externally. Here in Australia, we're concerned about the implications for our economic health of Europe hovering on the brink of even greater crises, combined with the possibility of China's growing economic growth and a slow United States economic recovery. We can be absolutely sure that Japan, as the world's third largest economy, with a vast array of global interests, is much more focused on the very real impact these developments have on its interests. Secondly, given Japan's geographical, geopolitical position so close to China in the critically dynamic North Asia region, Japan is exposed very directly to the ebbs and flows of what is taking place. While in Australia we talk about these things often, we're relatively removed from the, the immediate focus in which Japan finds itself. China's huge growth and strategic reach is Japan's abiding front of mind concern. And its awareness of necessity often shapes, and this awareness of necessity often shapes Japanese policy making. Overhanging historical issues, as well as traditional cultural linkages, arouse great sensitivities within Japan. China overtook Japan as the second largest global economy in 2010. And China is increasingly asserting its interests regionally and internationally. Fixation on China's second pole position after the United States often means Japan's still very strong economic power as the number three is pushed aside almost as if it's been a failure. Japan and China have a very complex relationship. On the one hand, there are great synergies with significant economic integration between the two economies. China is Japan's biggest export market and its most important trading partner. It's the destination for extensive Japanese investment and the largest source of its tourists. Overall, China is a key element in Japan's economic performance. But Japan's highest quality products, technology, equipment, and large investment have been a major factor in China's development. On the other hand, China's greater readiness to assert itself means it is often seen in Japan as a threat to Japan's interests. China has a growing defense capability, including a widening naval reach. While Japan's self-defense force is constrained by the Japanese constitution in what it can do, Japan is always quick to keep alive, for political reasons, the ugly side of Japan's occupation of China. Nor has the Japanese education system, to be frank, been able to address this adequately itself. Let's look at an example which illustrates this preoccupation with the China threat. <coughs> in 2010, soon after the series a series of incidents involving disputed territorial claims in the South China Sea had unsettled a number of Southeast Asian littoral states. An incident occurred near the disputed Senkaku, or in Chinese, Diaoyu Island group, where when a Chinese fishing boat strayed well into waters claimed by China, by Japan, it acted provocatively and caused a prolonged standoff that spiralled into China's temporarily restricting the supply of rare earths, a commodity essential. By the way, China controls 95% of the world's uh, production of rare earths. Uh, and that's a commodity essential for Japan's automotive sector, and Japan is China's biggest customer for rare earths as well. This dispute frightened many in Japan and galvanized thinking already underway about the wisdom of spreading its exposure to risk in order to avoid an over-dependence on China. The extent to which the Japanese government and businesses are now more resolved than ever to spread their risk beyond China should not be underestimated. This is relevant because if Japanese business houses are keen to expand and grow, as inevitably business corporations are, they must go offshore to newly emerging markets at a time when the opportunities or doing so domestically in Japan are relatively limited by high cost structures and declining productivity. 
The increased focus by Japan on non-Chinese Asia includes Australia. As Japan thinks strategically about its situation and seeks to broaden sources of supply and destinations for its investment and exports, India's growth and its likelihood of becoming another major economic powerhouse rival in China is a further particular focus of Japanese interest. India lags well behind China at this point in the degree of Japanese economic involvement in the country, but greater Japanese exposure in India is indeed likely over coming years. Japan has always had significant investments in Southeast Asia, and this region is once again a renewed focus. Both economic and strategic factors are at play, so Japanese interest is growing. Japan's investments in Vietnam and, in, 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 and Indonesia, as well as Thailand, Malaysia and Singapore, are already significant. And as these two economies grow fast, Japan's interest in them will develop, helping to balance its level of exposure to China. Myanmar is one strong new area, arena of interest for Japan. Japan has always had a special interest in that country. Having occupied Myanmar during the war, Japan provided extensive aid and loans in the post-war environment, which were suspended after many countries imposed sanctions when the military regime usurped power in the 1990s. With all Western and Japanese investment loans effectively out of the picture, China assumed a truly dominant role in recent years in the Myanmar economy as the most extensive, significant in external, uh, external influence. With the democratic reforms of the past 18 months taking place and the gradual lifting of sanctions underway, the Myanmar authorities' desire to balance Chinese dominance has seen Japan swift in its response. President Tan Sein was fated in Japan recently with the cancelling of $3.7 billion of debt and resumption of full-scale development assistance to Myanmar. Japanese corporations are already active and resource-rich Myanmar looking to expand alternative sources of minerals and energy. This example illustrates, I think, very well how Japan is capable of acting quickly when its interests are best served by a change of policy. <coughs> Assuming Japan continues on this path of building excuse me. Assuming Japan continues on this path of building up its level of economic interaction with non-Chinese Asia, we could well see Japan once again taking a leading role in underpinning Asia's economic growth and modernization, but in some new arenas. Japanese investment in technology over the past 40 years frankly should be given a lot more credit than it is given, at least because it is given as, at least as much as China's growth is doing now uh, to helping move countries from the low levels of economic development to the status of tiger economies. Similarly, let's not forget that the rise of China's steel and automotive industries as well as others owes much to Japanese investment and technology transfer which flowed into China right from the very early stages of China's opening up in the beginning of the 1980s. The unresolved situation in North Korea remains a major hotspot in the region's strategic environment. And as we were reminded recently with its albeit failed attempt to launch a so-called satellite with actually a new long-range rocket. And in passing, I note that in recent years, Japan and South Korea, at least under Lee Myung-bok's presidency, have worked collaboratively on seeking to address North Korea's nuclear program, despite lingering historical and territorial issues between them. But the intriguing question, and I just really throw this on the table, is this unresolved scenario, in this unresolved scenario, is whether the advent of its new young leader might not be the opportunity for North Korea even to undergo some positive, uh, positive changes opening up over the coming decade. Let's watch this space. Japan's ability to play a role in resolving North Korean issues remains constrained, however, as long as there are still overhanging questions related to the North Koreans' abduction of Japanese citizens decades ago. 
The United States continues as the bulwark of Japan's security all through their defence lines going back to the years of the post-war peace settlements. Despite local tensions associated with the continuing heavy American presence in Okinawa, the United States still actually enjoys a positive image in Japan. After setbacks early on in the Hatayama led DPJ administration, that reputation has recovered and actually was significantly bolstered when the United States launched a, a massive relief support effort following the earthquake and tsunami, when they sent thousands of personnel, hundreds of aircraft and many naval vessels to work alongside the self-defence forces under its Operation Tomodachi or Operation Friend. When Prime Minister Norda visited Washington at the end of April this year, he and President Obama issued a joint statement which reinforced the alliance and their joint commitment to, quote, regional and global peace, prosperity and stability, end quote. Consistent with Obama's announced pivot to Asia, the planned realignment of 10,000 Marines away from Okinawa not only will help reduce the immediate impact of the United States forces on the ground, but also allows more flexibility in the United States' capacity to deploy its forces in response to security contingencies that might develop in the region. These are quite important steps forward in restoring lost trust, but the major issue of relocating the Fatema base away from its crowded urban site to another location in Okinawa remains unresolved, ensuring that there will be continued irritants in the alliance. A further issue is the pressure from some quarters in Japan that would like to remove the current constitutional strictures that allow Japan's defence force to play to allow, sorry, to allow Japan's defence force to play a more regular role, one that goes beyond self-defence. There's a lot of time yet on that issue to play out there. A further feature in the region in recent years in which Japan has played an important role has been the consolidation of new global and regional groupings, in particular the East Asia Summit and the G20 Summit. The expansion of the EAS from an ASEAN plus three plus three uh, arrangement that included Australia, New Zealand and India to one which is effectively ASEAN plus eight, encompassing also the United States and Russia, closely reflected Japan's interests in drawing the United States more closely into regional cooperation to balance China's influence. On the other hand, Japan, as a member of the exclusive G7, was much less enthusiastic about the primary global role accorded to the G20 summit over the G7, even though the G20 is more representative, and of course it includes China. As for Australia, Japan remains our most important partner in Asia, even as other regional pressures and economic relationships change. While China has overtaken Japan as the world's second largest economy and also as our most important trading partner, this does not necessarily imply a degrading, downgrading of Japan's very important relationship with Australia. Japan has played a formative leadership role in expanding Australia's economy as well as others in Asia. This is important because while the national interests of Australia and Japan respectively demand that we each build constructive and fruitful relationships with China, Japan's proven positive and ongoing contribution to modern global and regional development while promoting the rule of law is what marks it out as having a special place and role in the region and clear synergies with Australia. This means we have a crucial role and responsibility to work jointly together wherever we can. Most critically, I'll mention security cooperation, which has grown much stronger in recent years with a significantly higher level of mutual confidence and increased awareness of each other's capabilities between the Australian Defence Force and the Japanese SDF. Cooperation in Iraq built on earlier joint activities in East Timor and the Cambodian peacekeeping operations. At crucial times, this also impacted positively, interestingly, on the FTA negotiations because it overall raised Japan's, many politicians in the Japanese uh, diet, their awareness of Australia's very real over support and uh, overall support and commitment to, to Japan. They felt obliged so they didn't stand in our way when we needed to pursue a feasibility study on the free trade agreement. In the weeks following the earthquake and tsunami disaster, no other country apart from the United States had military air car aircraft in Japan conducting sustained and trusted operations in support of the relief effort 
and no other country apart from the United States had such extensive security cooperation with Japan and Australia did. Prime Minister Gillard's visit in April 2011 to the worst affected areas, the first by any foreign leader, was highly appreciated in Japan and reinforced the high level of warmth and trust in the bilateral relationship. And I'll tell you an interesting story. I had a senior Japanese politician here uh, that I was asked to meet uh, 10 days ago. And that was just at the time of the very worst of the slipper and, and uh, other issues and the nadir of uh, Prime Minister Gillard's personal popularity as well as the Labour Party's popularity. And he said he couldn't understand because if there'd been an election in Japan when she'd been there, she would have won in a landslide. <laughs> Um, okay. um, these developments mean that many in Japan, including at the most senior political level, now have a deeper understanding of Japan's importance to Australia, as Japan learns to live with a much stronger Japan than China in its immediate security environment. The extremely close friendships between Australian and Japanese people are second to none. In my role as Chair of the Australian Japan Foundation, I'm delighted to be able to support exchanges and contacts at the non-official level. There is a vast network of schools links and sister city arrangements, with more Japanese children visiting Australia than any other country annually, under organised school groups. Tourism also plays an important role, while the depth and variety of cultural, scientific, medical, sporting, musical, artistic, and other intellectual exchanges is very rich indeed. These people-to-people -people links are the ballast for the very close official and business relationships that exist. An incalculable underpinning of trust has been built between us over years. This also enables us to continue building one of the most successful trade and investment relationships there is in this region. This is such that Japan arguably it's debatable, I suppose, remains Australia's largest overall economic partner broadly, not just in Asia, but globally. Why do I say that? Beyond the still very substantial trade flows, the story is much bigger. At nearly 50 billion, Japan's direct investment, realised direct investment in Australia to the end of 2010, was nearly four times that from China into Australia. When portfolio investment is included, Japan is Australia's third largest source of investment, 117.6 billion to the end of 2010, compared with a total of 19.5 billion from China, which was our 12th largest investment source. Moreover, Japan's investment continues to grow apace with the rate of new Chinese investment. But Unlike the majority of Chinese investment, it's not limited to the resource and energy sector. It, is, it now embraces also clean energy, infrastructure, food and agribusiness, financial services and ICT. While China will continue to grow in importance for both Japan and Australia, and each country will be looking at how it develops its long-term relationship with China, there is no reason why Australia's bilateral relationship with Japan will not also continue to prosper and strengthen. It will take time, no matter what is the level of the trade and investment links between Australia and China, to develop the same character with the relationship we enjoy with Japan, given our long dealing history of dealing with each other, our common interests and our purposes in the Asia-Pacific region. Australia and Japan share unique synergies, including mature democratic governance, I mentioned the extremely close people-to-people -people relationships, and also our strongly complementary economies. Again, this huge flow of trade and investment between Australia and Japan must not be taken for granted. We need more than ever to have a proper understanding broadly of the ongoing vital importance to both countries of the Australia and Japan Economic Partnership in its many dimensions, especially in the context of our deepening regional cooperation and security cooperation. How can we expand this economic partnership further? First, a free trade agreement with Japan would mean getting rid of the high level of protectionism which stifles 
natural market growth, thereby opening up new opportunities for growth in our trade and investment. Negotiations on the FTA continue to be a hard slog and will need sustained political movement commitment from both sides. The Nauta government supports economic partnership agreements, as they call them, as a key plank of opening up and reviving the economy generally. But as I described, dire politics, understandably, make this difficult to advance. Secondly, we should always seek ways to realise each other's creative potential and how to work together with equal creativity. The peak Australian and Japanese business councils are pursuing public-private partnerships so we can use our own respective strengths of financial management and experience to undertake major projects at times of tight government budgets. Thirdly, there are many other new areas hitherto untapped with wide scope of growth of trade and investment which the FTA could help unleash. These embrace the services sector, including legal services, education and tourism, health, alternative energy innovation, aged care, online sales, creative and performing arts and so on. Engagement in such business activity gives substance to Japan and Australia, retaining an effective, clear vision of how our future in this dynamic region can be. We have shown ourselves to be true friends who have strong goodwill towards each other in times of dire need. This demands more than ever we sustain the practical effort necessary to assure us of, our, of a bright future.